Uh, good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to Shoals Marine Laboratory's uh, uh, Rock Talk seminar. Um, I'm Dr. David Buck, the Associate Director of the lab. For those of you who are joining us from afar and perhaps aren't familiar with uh, Shoals Marine Lab, uh, it is the largest and oldest undergraduate focused marine lab in the country. Uh, we are jointly operated by the University of New Hampshire and Cornell University. And the lab is located in the southern part of the Gulf of Maine within the Isles of Shoals, a group of islands approximately 10 miles offshore of Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Um, the Rock Talk series provides an opportunity for the lab, our students, faculty, researchers, and um, this year, of course, our broader community because we've gone virtual uh, for us to come together, merging issues in marine science. Um, this summer, as with last summer, our Rock Talk seminars are uh, evolving with this COVID landscape, and we're doing them virtually, as I mentioned. But this year, we're fortunate to have students on the island. Uh, three courses are present tonight, uh, our field animal behavior class, integrated ecosystem research and management class, and also our ecology and marine environment class. So welcome to all of you students who are there on Appledore. Um, this is a, a really wonderful time of year to have you all on the island and we welcome you back after a, a very unique 2020 summer. So our format for this evening is a 45 minute talk followed by a 15 minute uh, question and answer period. If you'd like to ask a question, uh, I would ask you to take a look at the bottom of your Zoom screen. You'll see a little Q&A box where you can type in your questions. Um, and if you need technical help, also please, uh, you know, ask through the Q&A um, forum. And then at the end of the talk, I'll read the questions out loud to our speakers tonight and, and they will address them. So we are very fortunate um, tonight to have Dr. Lauren Devine with us this evening. Uh, Lauren is the Director for the Ecosystem Conservation Office and Director of the Bering Sea Research Center for the Alouette Community of St. Paul's Island. Um, it's a federally recognized tribe in the Pribilof Islands of Alaska. Her education and experiences in Alaska have brought her to a unique position within the tribal government where she has the opportunity <clears throat> to span the boundaries across Western science, local and traditional knowledge, uh, tribal, federal, and state management, which is very complicated, I'm sure, as well as a unique uh, community of stakeholders that focused on community-based citizen science programs. Lauren seeks to strengthen relationships across these varying boundaries um, in order to better serve the community, wildlife, and overall marine and terrestrial systems of St. Paul, uh, the greater Bering Sea, and across the Arctic region. And we're very fortunate tonight also joining Lauren is uh, Martin Stepiton, who is one of Lauren's collaborators who grew up on St. Paul Island. Uh, Martin grew up living a, a subsistence life on St. Paul, and he's here with us tonight to help provide some perspective on life in the Pribilof Islands. Their Rock Talk this evening will discuss work uh, with the Indigenous Sentinels Program, a collaboration between uh, Lauren's office and a host of both federal, state, tribal, Aboriginal, private, and nonprofit conservation organizations, uh, both within Alaska and neighboring Canada. So we're very pleased to have uh, both Dr. Devine and Martin participate in this evening's Rock Talk. Please join me in welcoming them both. And I pass the virtual mic to you. Um, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you so much. So I'm just gonna start sharing my screen and start our slideshow. Let me know if you are seeing just a title slide or the presenter slide. Is it just our? Just our picture? Okay. Well, thank you so much for having both Martin and I. We're really excited to share some of the Purple Off Islands um, work that, that we do on the island. I'm very excited to have Martin who grew up on St. Paul and um, is much more knowledgeable about the ecosystem there than I am um, to start us off. So um, Martin will start the presentation and then I'll provide a, a quick kind of very high level overview of some um, projects that we work on, ways that we contribute to things that I, I think are relevant to all three of the different classes that are joining us uh, and to the broader community. And then um, I'll pass it back to Martin and hopefully we'll get some good questions generated throughout our presentation. Um, so I will say thanks for, for coming. Welcome to the Pribilof Islands. Welcome to St. Paul. This is St. Paul in the summertime and uh, hand it over to Martin. 
Oh, thank you, Lauren. Um, can, I, can you hear me okay, Lauren? Okay, thank you. Oh, well, um, I'm really happy you guys could see this. Um, I'm actually not home right now. I'm, I'm in Juneau, Alaska right now. I, I live here in Juneau now, but um, as, as, you, as I said, I'm, I'm from St. Paul Island, Alaska. I, I grew up there. Uh, I was born in Anchorage, Alaska, but I grew up in St. Paul Island. Uh, that's where my, yeah, my mother and my father is from. Uh, my grandparents are from, and uh, I could draw my lineage back uh, all the way back to the Aleutian Islands, uh, where where everybody from the Pribilofs, uh, the Aleuts, come from, the Unungans, as they say. Um, even my my great grandfather and great grandmother, uh, they're not actually from the Pribilofs. They they grew up in in uh, on Alaska Island, uh, Dutch Harbor, uh, where you would probably see the deadliest catch uh, boats uh, on on Discovery Channel. You know. Well, that's where my people are from. That's where we've been for 10,000 years. And uh, you could find archaeologists have found stuff from uh, from the Aleuts dating back uh, long before the the pyramids were around, you know. So we've, we've been in the uh, Aleutian Islands and the Pribilofs for a long time. Um, our time in St. Paul is it started out in the 1700s. And that was really because we were um, we were under basically under slavery by the uh, by the Russian Empire for uh, fur seal harvesting and uh, and so in the, around 1788 is whenever we first uh, uh, really established ourselves in in the, in the Pribilofs and you could see on the picture there the the men on their knees they're salting the pelts right there. And they're getting ready to salt them, and then they're going to put them in barrels and ship them off to uh, San Francisco, where they would be uh, they would be uh, processed more and uh, and sold off. This was by far the most profitable um, um, business in Alaska for a long time. Um, a lot of people don't know, but the first time. The United States ever had their $7.2 million paid off was on the backs of about two or 300 Aleuts in the Pribilof Islands selling these fur pelts um, a couple years after uh, they bought it, you know. So the first time Alaska ever paid for itself was from those fur pelts right there. That's what, that's what it came from. And, and uh, based on about two or 300 Aleuts in St. Paul and St. George. Um, so yeah, I, I, I'm 35 years old. I'm a millennial, you know, <laughs> and so I, I live here in Juneau now, but um, I, I grew up in St. Paul. I grew up with subsistence lifestyle. Um, you know, we never went without food. We always had seal meat. We always had, um, you know, lived off the land and uh, learned how to hunt, learn how to fish. I grew up to become a commercial fisherman. That's what I was before I moved to Juneau. Um, I was just telling uh, Yvette, who is who we're working with here, who I am actually on the school board with uh, here in Juneau, uh, that you know I grew up to become a fisherman. That's I, I couldn't really imagine doing anything else. That's kind of what you did uh, whenever you come from St. Paul. I wanted to have a boat. You know that was. That was making it for for me out there, and, and I <laughs> I came close to doing it, but um, I, I I I changed course and ended up going to school off island. Um, but I grew up. I started commercial fishing whenever I was 16 years old, uh, long lining halibut out in the out in the Bering Sea on uh, 35 foot boats. Uh, we would catch anywhere between. 25,000 and 100,000 pounds of halibut per summer. I get a 10% deckhand share and um, did pretty good. You, you could make a living off that. That's how it's still done out there right now. Um, but as I got older and uh, you know graduated high school, I, I jumped on the big boats and started fishing uh, you know, uh, on the high seas in the Bering Sea, going after cod going after uh, large amounts of halibut far out to sea. And, and so, um, you know, catching 360,000 pounds of halibut in one fishing season, or, um, you know, I, we, we did really well catching a uh, cod, you know, we caught 2.2 million pounds of cod in 
in one in one season, you know. So I, I did the most money ever made in one year was out commercial fishing, and, and that's how a lot of people make their livings out there nowadays. Um, but I, I'll, I'll leave it there. There's there's a lot of there's a lot of information I could go on and on, but uh, if you have anything to, to also share, Lauren. I was gonna forward the slide and maybe you could talk a little bit about um, internment during the war. Yeah, yeah. So uh, as, as I was saying earlier, uh, the Russian, the Russian uh, people are the ones that brought us to from the Aleutian Islands. Back, back in 1500s, you know, pre-contact before the Russians came to the Aleutian Islands, all throughout the Aleutian Islands, the Aleuts were about 20,000 strong, you know, and uh, it wasn't long after the Russians came and um, they, they slaughtered the Aleuts. It was, it was terrible. You could read stories and research this. Uh, they, they've tried experiments like see how many bullets you could get through lining up the Aleuts and, and you know, shooting a musket through them. And it's, it's terrible. It's a horrible history. It's a very typical uh, Western civilization coming to, uh, Native, uh, you know, Native Americans, except it wasn't from the Europeans on the East Coast. It was the Russians over here for us, you know, um, in, on, in the Lucian chains and all throughout Alaska. The Clinkets here in Juneau uh, went to war with uh, went to war with the Russians. And um, so up until, by the time we were moving into St. Paul in the 1700s, we were down, our, pop, our alley population was down around, you know, we got down to as low as 2,000 alleys at one point, you know, we, we almost became extinct people, you know, because of the Russians, but they had us under complete control at that point. We, we went up to uh, St. Paul in uh, around the 1700s and uh, I could I could trace back my, my grandfather's uh, my grandmother's to those days and once we became established in St. Paul um, the, the Americans the Americans uh, became uh, started taking over and um, in as I was saying and after the, the United States bought Alaska off of off of um, Russia for, for seven point two million dollars. The main reason they bought it was for the fur trade out here in Pribilofs. Fishing wasn't didn't exist at that point. The the oil none of that was even around yet. You know, the big fishing industry none of that was around. The main profitable business in Alaska was this fur trade. And it was based on slavery of my people. And, um, and so after, you know, fast forward up until the, the World War II, and this is a picture of the people on the Delaroff here getting to, you know, in 1942, the Japanese armies bombed uh, on Alaska Dutch Harbor, uh, for two or three days and at that point um, the U.S. military was planning to move the Aleuts off of St. George and off of St. Paul and as you could see they took about 477 of, of uh, people from St. Paul and St. George and uh, Atka, Nikolsky, Unalaska and they brought them all the way down here to Funter Bay, Killisnew, Wrangell, Burnett Inlet very far away from from where uh, these Aleut people knew anything about. We didn't know anything about, there's no trees in St. Paul. There is no trees in St. Paul. What are, what are trees, you know? We don't know what trees are. And um, they brought us down to Funter Bay. Here's a picture of Funter Bay. Uh, they put us in these this fish plant that was already, had been derelict for about 10 or 20 years. It had no running water. It had, no heating, it had no bathrooms, nothing. There was, and you know, whenever they told us to get ready to come down here, they said, you guys have one hour to get your stuff ready and get on the boat. 
and we didn't have any food. We, they didn't give us any blankets. It wasn't heated, you know. I mean, if you could just imagine, and it was coming up on winter time, you know, there was nothing, and they just dropped us off in Thunder Bay. And uh, my people from St. Paul and St. George were dropped off in Thunder Bay. There was a couple other communities on with us uh, on the boat at the time, and that was the people from ACTA. And there wasn't enough room in Thunder Bay for the ACTA people, so they brought them down to Killis, New Island. And that was near Angoon, where my wife is from. My wife is from uh, Angoon. That's near uh, Killis, New And this... What happened after the, the military brought us down was terrible. It's just a sad story. Um, Funter Bay was where about 40 people died out of about 477 of us. Because of this lack of planning, no medicine, no heat, you know, starvation, malnutrition, you know. And uh, it wasn't until about the 90s whenever people started, you know, saying, hey, something, you know, really bad happened. And, and uh, that's whenever they began working on taking care of this grave site uh, where, where, you know, these 40 people had passed away. And um, I moved down here in 2011, and I knew about this piece of history uh, from my grandmother and from, from a lot of people talking about it. And, uh, I made a trip here to Funter Bay uh, in around 2014, 2015. And um, from that trip, I learned that one of the sites where the Killisnew people were, uh, there's we know the people from Akko and Killisnew, and we know about 20 of them died there because of the same reason, ill planning, neglect, no food, bad water, you know, and uh, just, sad story but they that cemetery right now sits on private land and in my culture we take care of our cemeteries we take care of our, our loved ones and the main reason we were worried about that is because we do want to visit the cemetery whenever we want we do want to come and go and and um that's what made me start working with uh friends of admiralty island who is a uh, who oversees the Admiralty Island um, monument put in by uh, President, help me out here, uh, President Carter. President Carter put the monument down on uh, of Admiralty Island. It's a huge island and um, that, that's part of the, the monument. That's what Friends of Admiralty does is helps protect that monument. And so we, I work with Friends of Admiralty Island to figure out who owns the land under the Funter Bay Cemetery. And from that, we figured out the state of Alaska did. And from there, we went to, we approached the, uh, the department that manages this piece of land, which happens to be the Department of Natural Resources. We told them what we thought, we told them what we want to do, and they supported us. They said, we know what you want to do, we support you. And that was in about 2016. And uh, from that point on, we knew we had something. We knew we could make a bill out of it. It started out uh, with uh, Representative Sam Keto, who was the, uh, the representative before uh, Sarah Hannon, who actually passed HB uh, 122. Uh, that just passed literally just a, about a week ago. The, the governor just signed HB 122 about a week ago. This is Alaska state law here now. Um, and that protected about 260 acres where the Aleuts were buried in Funter Bay. That land is now protected now and forever. The only way to ever change that law is it would have to go through the legislature again and the governor would have to sign off it again. That's an almost impossible task. So it's protected strong, very strong now. And uh, we know that our loved ones will, will, will rest easy knowing that they won't, there will be no logging around that cemetery. There will be no fish camp built right next to it. And it's managed by the Alaska State Parks now. The Alaska State Parks has enforcement laws. They could, they could keep people from uh, vandalizing. They have, uh, they have a budget to, to put in trails to the cemetery, you know, so 
it's just a great thing that just happened. I'm very much, uh, I've been working on this bill for a long time and I'm really, really happy it passed. And um, so I'm very much steeped in this work right now. We're not done in Funter Bay yet, but um, I, I, I could go on about that. I spent a lot of time doing that. Do you want to speak towards um, kind of the life on St. Paul today? And then I'll jump into the science side. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, well, the life on St. Paul is, uh, it's a really, it's a great place to raise kids. St. Paul is, is a beautiful place. I love St. Paul. And um, I have a house out there that uh, my dad gave to me and my three brothers whenever he passed away. And I also bought a house whenever I was uh, becoming a successful fisherman. I, I bought up the school district and I, I rent that out to one of my friends. And, and so I'm very much connected to uh, the going ons of, of back home still. And, and um, yeah, so every year, um, they do traditional hunting and fishing. Um, they have a seal harvest every summer where they harvest uh, fur seals. And uh, we go after, we put away a lot of meat. Uh, people eat a lot of seal meat in St. Paul. I think more than anywhere else in Alaska, just because that's that's what's readily available to us. And we grew up on it. Uh, uh, you could see the men holding, you know, butchering a seal there and, uh, it, it really is good meat, you know, it could sustain a person. And this is what we've come to uh, come to live off of and subsist on. And so we are very close to um, the seals on St. Paul. It's uh, what, what has got us through all the hard times. If uh, there was no Western food on St. Paul, the Aleuts could still survive for a long time. And so, um, we have fur seals, we have halibut, we have um, we have birds. A lot of people harvest birds and the eggs that the, those are myrrh eggs that you just seen in the picture earlier. A lot of people harvest myrrh eggs in, in the summertime, you know? And uh, yeah, see, that's a myrrh egg right there. You know, the way they get those, the way they get those is they, they tie a rope around a young boy and they let him climb over the cliff, down the cliff and you, the little boy, takes the eggs and puts it in a little bag and then they pull them back up and that's how they get them. That's how they've done it for a long time. <laughs> so um, St. Paul is just a, it's a really beautiful place and, and uh, it's where, you know, St. Paul is 90% uh, Unangan, Aliyuts and, and um, it's, this is how it looks. This is it's beautiful. This is a summertime bloom right here. Um, uh, you, there's a lot, of, there's these wild celery, it's called puchkis, and uh, you could eat it, it's really sweet. I, I grew up eating puchkis, I used to eat it until I got full, you know. I mean, it's really good, you know. So, uh, there's berries, there's blackberries there, uh, there's salmon berries, um, and people harvest this stuff every summer. And um, right now, right now, it's people are getting ready to gear up to go fishing, commercial fishing, right now. And um, all the college kids are coming home to help their mothers and uh, uh, fathers uh, get, get the boats ready. They're, uh, all the college kids are coming home to just be with their families for the summer, go sealing, uh, help pick berries, help, uh, help do the harvest. And uh, you can see here, the way we harvest our seals in St. Paul is, is some people go out to the sea but we club our seals. That's how we get our seals. That's how we've done it for the for the industrial part of sealing. But that's also how we do it now. And it's a humane way to get seals. It's a humane way to, to get seal meat. And um, we you can see the clubs here on the far left and the far right. It's a uh, and these are the harvesters. This is a this is a group of people would go out and, and harvest the seal meat uh, and uh, hand it out to those who order seal meat every year and every day. And um, yeah, these these are I could I could see a whole bunch of my family in this picture now that I'm looking at it. <laughs> um, but behind uh, the folks that you can see is a it's shut down, but it used to be a hotel. It's a really old building, but uh, the the government is the one that put that in the U.S. government. And up to the upper uh, upper left, you can see the church. Uh, we are Russian Orthodox. Uh, 
I think you know why, but uh, everybody is Russian Orthodox. Uh, I have all of my children uh, baptized as Russian Orthodox Christians. And, um, and this is the ball field that they're on. Every year uh, they celebrate, or they don't celebrate, they do a memorial walk because in, in World War II, whenever they're taking us off the island, what they are doing at that time is they're playing baseball. They were playing baseball in 1942 and they came and they told them, you guys have one hour to pack a bag and get on the boat. And so every year they do that again, they play baseball and they do the walk out to East Landing where they get, where they had to get on the boat. And uh, they remember those they lost over 10%, over 40 people died in a matter of two, two or three years. And, uh, and so, um, that is that is something uh, I just wanted to mention. I would love to just let you talk forever. I, I would I would I want to give you all of my time. <laughs> <laughs> um, thanks for sharing. And and um, I let's switch gears just for, in the interest of time. I'll present some of my slides and then Martin. I'm I am gonna make sure to leave time. Um, for a little bit more from you, because um, I, I think the storytelling is such an important piece of this and just understanding um, your perspective and, and life on St. Paul is really important and it drives what we do at the tribe. So um, I, I work for the tribal government um, and the ecosystem conservation office is analogous to something like a department of fish and game or a, a US Fish and Wildlife Service type uh, wildlife branch. but because we work for tribal members, we serve our tribal membership, um, our Unangan community in St. Paul. I, you know, my everything that I do is um, for the benefit of, of tribal members. And so um, we, out of necessity, wear a lot of hats and we take every effort to um, use kind of our, our diverse staff and, and most of our, um, employees are Unangan tribal members um, or, or um, spouses or partners of tribal members. And so we take a very different worldview than kind of the Western science perspective that I grew up with and that I learned in school. And it's been a really fantastic relearning experience for me as a biologist to be able to work for a tribal government on their wildlife resources, on these traditional very Cultural, culturally important species and, and get to experience working in an environment um, and creating new relationships with it than I had ever known were possible um, with kind of my background. And so we live in the Bering Sea and the Bering Sea is beautiful and it also looks like this a lot. Um, the Pribilofs are known for their very harsh weather. I've never felt more alive than when I'm trying to um, walk in a, a blizzard or a snowstorm or this, this crazy, very windy, very foggy, very um, rainy uh, weather. And it's, it's beautiful and it gives us a really rich ecosystem to work with. And so I'm gonna share just a little bit of some of the projects that we do. And, and one of the first ones is, is around the environment, just looking at climate change and looking at the environment. And we know that we have National Weather Service and um, National Marine Fisheries, and we have a lot of federal and state agencies that are interested in our area of the world because we are in the middle of the Bering Sea. And Martin talked about the fisheries and they are plentiful and they're very important to our global economy, our national economy, and, and um, we're right smack dab in the middle of it. And so um, in an effort to really kind of take some of the, the authority and, and have our own data to work with, have our own information to be able to go to um, federal and state agencies with and, and track our own uh, ecosystem for our local decision making, we have looked at what we can start monitoring in the ecosystem um, to create some some data sets from. One of the things that we've done, of course, that's it's kind of a, a easy thing for us to do is monitor the water column. We have a harbor, we have boats coming in and out, we have a fish processing plant, um, and it provides us a platform to take some scientific equipment and go out and um, take the temperature and salinity of our of our water column. And those are seemingly really easy things to collect, but what it does over time is it really gives us um, 
a baseline to compare future years to. And when we've looked at the data here, you can see this, this was actually um, contributed to the um, ecosystem status report that Abet and others work on and turn in on a yearly basis to fisheries managers. And so we were able to take our local, um, you know, small scale data set. And the information was really interesting because what we actually caught um, in uh, monitoring our temperature and salinity is here, I'm, I'm apologize for the uh, scratchiness of this, but we actually detected that the salinity of our water column is increasing over time. And that's really interesting because this is really fine scale information. And we expect to see, you know, things like the temperature, the water warms up and the water gets colder. And the reason that we're interested in this, of course, in, in climate change is that our fish move to colder waters. And so if we lose our cold water, we lose our fish and that's really devastating to our community. And so we started um, really with why this is important to our local community. And we realized that our data are important to the broader community, community to the broader scientific community and, um, and folks that, that make decisions and, and manage our larger ecosystems. And so this has been one really cool, um, quite simple thing that we can do. We go out and we drop a piece of equipment once weekly and we take this information and, um, you know, computer process it and out come these data. And so we're able to see if temperature swings start happening that are really disturbing, you know, we're gonna get that information really quickly and be able to make decisions locally about that information. And so that's kind of one, one broader environmental thing that we do. Uh, one of the really important things that we do, Martin spoke a lot to it, is um, harvesting marine mammals. And this is something that the federal government, because of the way the Pribilof Islands were permanently settled um, and the unique history of kidnapping Unanga men and bringing them to St. Paul and St. George to um, be slaves, uh, harvesting fur seals and selling the pelts um, for profits of you know, foreign governments and then eventually our federal government. Um, this fur seal harvest has always drawn a lot of um, contention and the way that fur seals are harvested today um, is both through hunting and then through um, not using not using firearms, but using the, the clubbing method um, that Martin spoke to earlier. And so there's a variety of, of different ways to uh, for tribal members to obtain this resource. And to the general public, um, this is uh, not something that that people have a lot of good understanding around and understand the the culture and the the physical nutrition that it's feeding families and sustaining life in that way. It's super rich in um, vitamins. It's very hearty meat, a very iron rich meat. Um, it is very wholesome. And there's also a lot of spiritual and emotional and, um, you know, meaning that are tied to these animals that, that are, have nothing to do with consuming fur seal. Um, and that's something that I don't think you can fully understand until you come to the islands and you experience it and you get to know individual people and families um, that, that are really, they call themselves people of the seal. Um, tribal members are people of the seal and they steward this resource. And it's, um, it's so meaningful to have access to these animals. And because of the way that um, the federal government profited from fur seals, uh, there's a long history of research, but there's also a long history of oversight and trying to control the way that fur seals are used by tribal members. Um, and so that's been a really interesting thing to learn and be a part of. Um, and um, a lot of what we do has to do with monitoring and research of fur seals. And so um, one of the things that we've done is to look at the timing of departure of pup. So every year pups are born, they're nursed through the summer and then the fall time, the moms uh, stop nursing them. They leave the island and go out uh, to overwinter in the Bering Sea or broader North Pacific down to California and the pups are left on their own. They have to learn how to swim. They have to learn how to hunt food in the ocean and, and um, navigate the big scary North Pacific um, as, a, as a little pup. And so the, um, 
the departure of pups is super important. We want them to be fat and healthy when they leave. Um, we want them to, to survive that overwintering period and come back to the islands as adults and breed um, for the population. This is um, really an area of research because pups are not surviving and they're not getting enough food. They're not being able to survive. And this is one area that we are very um, fiercely advocating for some conservation of fur seals in the Pribilof Islands. Um, it's been really devastating. It's been happening for decades. And so um, we are tracking this very closely to, to look at, you know, what is the what is the health of pups when they leave and, and, and is when they're leaving changing um, because of climate change or other reasons. And um, this is just a quick, you know, interesting thing um, to show is that we have these models that scientists um, like to, to talk about uh, and, and create for predicting when pups leave, but we also have people on the ground and those people on the ground are able to see and be with the first skills and they take really detailed uh, information about what they're seeing and we're able to actually verify models um, on the ground with our observations. And Martin, I saw your hand if you wanna. Yeah, no, I just, you know, I wanted to, you know, make a point about, you know, the, the fur seals and, and this is great data, you know, we, we know that the pups are starving while the mother is out in the summertime, out all summer long trying to get forage and feed herself enough and also get enough to come back to feed her pup who is on the beach, you know, and, uh, you know, trying to make it on its own. And so, we know that that time when the, the mother leaves the pup on the beach and goes out foraging has gotten longer and longer and longer. So for a long time, the fur seal, uh, the, the, the fur seals numbers are really low compared to where they have been historically for thousands of years. The fur seal population used to be massive hundreds of millions all throughout St. Paul Island, all far inland, you know, there used to be thousands of seals. But the main reason the population went down a long time ago was because of the industrial fur seal harvesting. That was the main reason the population came down. But it wasn't long after the fur seal harvest was shut down. After the fur seal harvest was shut down, all that was left was the subsistence harvesting and that's like a drop in the bucket compared to what the industrial fur seal harvesting was doing that doesn't even shouldn't even uh, affect the seals you know we we take enough to feed ourselves what we take is what we eat we don't waste any seal meat you know and so it's a it's a really um it's really important for people to know that the main reason the fur seal harvest is down now is because of the fur seals are starving out in the Barren Sea. There's not enough food in the water where the food used to be, where they could count on it, where they've been taught to go to find food. It's just not there anymore. And it's it's because of overfishing. Every All these seals eat the same fish that we, we catch, the cod, the halibut, the, you know. And so it's men fishing against seals feeding. That's, that's, the, that's the big uh, divide there. Yes, absolutely. And, and that's a really good point to make is that after the, the commercial harvest of fur seals ended, which was in the 1980s in St. Paul, um, it, fishing was then competing with fur seals. And actually the, the primary competition of, um, is prey on walleye pollock, which is your McDonald's fish sandwich or uh, fish sticks that you get from the frozen food section. Uh, they're the number one fishery in the US. It is um, swamps harvest by of all other fish um, by a lot. And it is very important for fur seals um, feeding, especially mom uh, lactating for females that are trying to, to nurse those pups to wait. And yeah, thank you for adding that. Um, because what what this is a good example of is we have known for decades uh, that fishing is, is an important factor in the decline. And that is something that is very well known in the community. And that is because we have this very rich body um, of knowledge that is held by tribal members from stories that have been handed down. One of the reasons that I was very, very honored to share this time with Martin is because it is the storytelling 
where information and knowledge is passed on and shared and given to others. And the communities of St. Paul and St. George have been sharing that knowledge for a very long time, very long time. Um, and this, this slide that shows kind of the on the ground observers um, verifying a, a model that a scientist in Seattle put together in a computer lab um, to look, look at predicting pups departing, like this is, a very interesting overlay of, of traditional knowledge and these um, individuals that have extensive experience on the ground because they've been hunting and fishing their entire lives on St. Paul. They grew up on St. Paul. They've watched the fur seals year in and year out and they understand the animal, animal behavior and they're putting very nuanced um, context to what they're seeing that you just can't get from just collecting data and information. And that's one of the reasons why it's really exciting um, to work for a tribal government in, in this kind of uh, research and monitoring, because you are getting to tap into and utilize and be a part of this whole system of knowledge that isn't documented in, um, you know, scientific literature or as a biologist we're taught to to publish manuscripts and give conferences you know presentations and put together powerpoints of, of data and information but those things never really pay the respect and and um, honor the vast body of knowledge that um, individuals hold from from being indigenous to a place for so long and having a long history and so um, yeah Martin you again like this is the perfect it's it's um it's just a second nature it's just of course um you understand what's happening with first seals and the reasoning behind it because you have all of that to draw from and and that's um separate and and akin to the science that that scientists are out there researching for and so i think this is a really good example of that and i i think in the interest of time i'm going to give you one more example which is marine debris and I present marine debris because it links back to fur seals, of course, and our marine mammals and um, understanding how important marine mammals are to our community. Entanglement is one of the big activities that we do on island and you can see why. We end up with a significant number of animals that have been um, curious as youngsters probably swimming around in the ocean and they see a piece of net, um, most often is fishing gear that they are encountering in the ocean. And as juveniles, they like to play and they're very curious. And what ends up typically happening is they'll swim through a, a piece of fishing gear um, that is a net fragment. It has a large enough hole. They can get there, they can swim through it as far as their neck will go. And then um, they can't get it off. And then they continue to grow and that net stays in place year after year. And so we end up with um, some, some really bad uh, entanglements. And what we do is we go out and we search for these whenever the seals are on island, which is typically May through September to October. And when we identify these seals, we attempt entanglements. The bottom picture that you see is a crew of um, island sentinels that have removed that piece of net um, from a seal. And so we also do marine debris cleanups to take the nets that you see in the upper right hand corner there um, off the beach and, and gear off the beach. And this includes buoys and rope and line and just massive amounts of, of trash. We work with our youth. Um, we employ crews on the island to remove debris. And I think the big piece of this that I wanna share is that this debris does not, is not generated locally. This is coming in from thousands and thousands of miles away. Um, this is potentially gear that is, hasn't been fished for more than 50 years. Um, a lot of the nets that we pull off of um, our seals, this, this green net that you see in these images is really common in the Pribilof Islands. And a lot of this net uh, is from a material that is, hasn't been fished in decades. And so these are ghost nets that have been out in the water and, and eventually wind up on our shores due to circulation and currents. And so we have been running a pretty robust uh, marine debris program. The burden is on us. Um, we have to fundraise for it. We have to hire a crew for it. And we have to take the time and energy to go out and collect this. We get about 20,000 pounds every other year, which we can only do it every other year because it is incredibly time consuming, um, laborious work. It is not fun. We take a crew of 10 to 12 people out 10 hours a day, um, pulling 
you know, thousands of pounds of debris off the shores uh, and getting it to our landfill where we can repack it and get it back hauled to um, mostly to Seattle to recycling centers and landfills, but we have to get this off of our shores. And so we've been conducting cleanups um, every year to every other year for, for quite a while. And you can see that a lot of our debris that we're getting are, are um, fishing associated gears. And then we also get a lot of plastics on our shore, but this is one way that we connect with um, the, the broader regional efforts, uh, state efforts and to national and even international efforts. We work a lot with the Arctic Council on um, and with other indigenous Arctic groups uh, like Sami in um, Scandinavia. Uh, we work with um, uh, Greenland and Iceland and, and Canada, Inuit in, in Canada on these types of efforts. And it's, it's really all links back to our um, concerns around, around fur seals. So I'm gonna end there and hand it back over to Martin. And I see that we do have some questions already popping up. So we're excited to, to take some questions. Yeah, I, I, I grew up doing that also. They really do uh, to get the youth involved and uh, heck the youth get paid nowadays. <laughs> I never got paid to do it whenever I was younger. You know how they used to get us to do it is they would let us run four wheelers, these uh, ATVs around and we would get to run these four wheelers around for as much as we wanted to as long as we we're doing cleanup, you know? And so that's how they got me out there all summer long, pulling these nets. And, and so it, it's really fun, you know? And, and, uh, and as you grow up and, and, you know, you get to know what you're actually doing, it was just fun to me back then, but the work really is important. Uh, this beach cleanup, as we call it, is, uh, it's really important. If you don't do it, man, those beaches would be plumb full of that, that uh, nasty net, all those seals have uh, get entangled. I, I was part of the crews. I used to uh, get those seals uh, and, you know, basically you have to find the seal, you have to sneak up on it, and you have to literally uh, wrap, wrap, get it, tackle it down, and then cut the net off it. And it's actually kind of a dangerous uh, endeavor. These seals are, get up to five, 600 pounds, you know? And so uh, I've, I've done that a lot, and uh, it's a uh, it's a labor of love, that's for sure. And it's really important work. So I'm happy we got to show that. Lauren and Martin, I wonder if, if now is a good time to, um, to look at the questions from the audience. Is that is our, a good, like, kind of a good stopping point to field some questions? Yeah, absolutely. Excellent. Well, um, Thank you very much for that for that talk. There was a, a lot of information shared, and I'm sure we've got lots of questions uh, from the crew. You know, at Martin, your comment about commercial fishing versus seal feeding um, is a very powerful one, and that that comparison is is very stark. I, I, it, uh, it, it communicates a, a message very eloquently. So thank you for that. Um, also, I was I was struck by the muir egg image. You know, we, we had our very first rock talker of the summer was a, a biologist who was doing work with muirs. And, and I was I'm fascinated to hear about how they were able to get those eggs off the cliffs because the images that I've seen previously are those cliffs are very vertical. So Quite, quite the adventure. So very, thank you very much for, for both the, the stories, the personal stories and the, the data sharing. I, I must admit that I got cut off um, the Zoom call somewhere in the middle. And so the Q&A on my end is actually, I only have one question and I'm hoping that people will kind of repopulate their questions. I got cut off accidents, but I have a question from from Bet Sidden, which I imagine is coming from the Integrated Ecosystem Research and Management class. And it's a question to you, Martin, um, asking if you can share a story or a perspective about changes in sea ice at St. Paul. Yeah, yeah, it's a. Uh, you know, we used to get sea ice every year. Uh, whenever I was growing up and, and the winters used to be really harsh too, but that was normal. Uh, really cold, big, huge mounds of snow. And uh, it's just so bizarre now that you can go a whole winter without snow sometimes. Like that never happened. Not ever when I was growing up. 
And so that, that can happen now. You can go a whole summer, a uh, whole winter without snow. And it, it's, it's uh, just crazy. It's something that is we notice every year. And it's like, well, are we going to get snow? Is there going to be snow on Christmas, you know? I mean, uh, stuff like that, you know. Um, we, didn't, we didn't used to have to think like that. And we know now that uh, we know that whenever the ice comes down, it brings down uh, uh, nutrition, and it, it does it does a lot for the uh, the fish and the wildlife out in the water. And uh, so the ice coming down is a good thing for us and the fishermen. And also, just it's a healthy thing that is supposed to happen that doesn't happen all the time anymore, and happens less and less actually. And it's something that we follow. We follow the ice. We like to know how many, how, how close is it to the northern part of the island? How many miles away? Oh, the ice is getting really close. Let's go look at it. We'll drive out, go look at the ice. You know, it's coming around, you know. And so um, it's just something that we, we are very aware of nowadays. Thank you for that, Martin. Lauren, I don't know if you have any comment to add. Yeah, sea ice is is exceedingly important, and it's it's true. It's something that um, residents on the island look for, know about, uh, are waiting for in the broader Bering Sea. It's super important because when it melts, all that cold water goes to the bottom of the ocean, and it sits on the bottom of the ocean, and that's actually where a lot of species of crab, snow crab and king crab, um, they seek out and, and go into that cold water and it kind of serves as a refuge because some of the other um, fish species that like to eat them can't get into that cold water. And so without that cold pool of water on the bottom every year to where crabs can kind of go and hide out in until they get big enough to avoid getting eaten, um, fish are really happy because they can eat them, but we are experiencing declining populations of those species. And so then you add on to that, um, you know, these big large scale fisheries that are also pulling the adults um, out of the water every year. Uh, and you're just not replenishing the populations at the same rate. And you're also not having those habitats be able to be there to um, provide a, a refuge for the species that, that need that to grow. And so we're really seeing devastating um, reductions in in halibut. Um, the fishermen are, are um, experiencing reduced quota to the point that we almost can't execute fisheries um, every year because we have such low quota and, and uh, there's just not enough um, fish out there to go out and catch. And so it's it really is a devastating um, thing that that everyone on the island is is watching happen. And unfortunately our uh, you know are virtually not responsible for causing those impacts. Like they are, they are contributing so little to climate change, but but definitely feeling the impacts the most. Yeah, thank you for that perspective, both of you. Um, a slightly different question here from from the ecology class and Jed, Dr. Jed Sparks. Um, he's asking if are there other parts of the seal uh, that is still used besides the meat. I wonder if I, either of you could speak to that, Martin, perhaps. Yeah, we use we use every part of the seal meat and and uh, every part of the seal was used as tools, you know, it was used as a, uh, we use the fat to, uh, we use the fat to, to help, um, you know, a, a bunch of, a bunch of different things. We use the, uh, if you look at the clothing of the alleys pre-contact, it was all made out of uh, seal guts. It was made out of the, the, the fur seal pelts. We would use the bones for tools. We'd use the teeth for hunting, and and so we really used every you know none of it went went to waste, and it was all used uh, and uh, all eaten too. You know, so none none of it goes to waste. We even have youth at the at the seal harvest um, that that take the throat tissue, and you can process it into a fabric, and it's a waterproof fabric and there's a lot of crafting that can be done with that. Uh, it's called chukun um, or the, the throat tissue and it's a really interesting process and it's, um, it's amazing. You can make uh, waterproof materials out of the intestinal linings, the, the throat linings. Um, it's, there's, we have uh, crafts made out of the, the ears of the seal. It's yeah, literally every part of it. 
I used to I used to go around as a youth and collect those uh, as a young man. I used to that was uh, I was hired by the uh, Aleut teacher uh, out of out of the school to harvest some for her, and that was part of my job. And I would ask, you know, hey, could I take could I take the throat? You know, the guy would be cutting the seal. Up. Oh, go ahead, you know. Okay, thank you. I'll go in there and cut the throat out myself, you know, and and uh, take it in my bag and bring it to the teacher, and she'd give me a you know a couple bucks for it or something, and and uh, <laughs> they would use that for her alley class and, and teaching other kids and. Uh, yeah. Cool. The, this next question is um, definitely a question for both of you. Um, it comes from Elizabeth Craig, who works on White and CV Islands. It's a turn colony that Shoals Marine Lab helps uh, support the monitoring and research of. And Liz is uh, one of the directors of that program. So she's at asking, do you have any advice for connecting and including indigenous people in one's research? Obviously her, in her case, it's here in New England, but at least speaking um, for researchers, yeah, either of you have any advice that might help kickstart a relationship and a collaboration? That's a, that's a tough one. Um, a lot <laughs> of, so I get a lot of cold calls and cold emails um, from graduate yeah. students, from, from professors, and I'd say the best way is to reach out and, and try to make a connection to the community that you um, want to work in. If you get shuttled around to a lot of different people, um, it happens, and just keep being consistent. And the biggest thing about um, working with Indigenous peoples in and communities is... Um, is relationship building and trust. And those both take time. And so it takes time to introduce yourself, um, earn the trust of, of a contact that is willing to entertain a conversation with you and, and build that relationship. And um, it's, it's not an overnight kind of thing. And so often the relationships that we have with researchers where we're really using these um, co-production approaches where the the indigenous you know the tribe and the tribal members and the indigenous group is really creating and the hypothesis with the observer or excuse me the researcher and the and the projects are are um, relevant to the community that's where we have taken time to build those relationships and projects together and so um, coming to a community and and just pitching your own idea that's already ready to go or you already have a proposal written or a, or a fun a funded thing is um, it's it's not maybe relevant to the community's priorities mm -hmm. and needs sure. and so um, I think that's the biggest thing is is really doing the research and the work to um, to figure out how to make your work relevant and helpful to the community to give give back. Um, Western science is very extractive. And so we really like to see that flip on its head and, and um, you know, build the relationship where there's mutual understanding and trust and respect to, to do research projects. But at the end of the day, it's um, cold, cold calls and, and emails and, and uh, making a connection. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, there, there's, there's definitely relationship building. Uh, me and Lauren were talking earlier about actually showing pictures of the seal harvest. Uh, that's kind of a taboo subject back home. We don't like to do that. Uh, you're not, not anybody is allowed to come out to the harvest and take pictures of us because uh, not long after the seal harvest was shut down, the industrial fur seal harvesting was shut down. Uh, you know, it wasn't long after that where PETA and these other environmentalist groups were coming to St. Paul and taking pictures of us and using it against us to try to take away our subsistence rights. And so we have trust issues around that. We don't like to just let anybody come out to our seal harvest. It's not a touristy thing. This is, it's a sacred act of us gathering food for ourselves. And uh, us sharing that with you folks today is something that we talked about and we we took pause to before we wanted to share those pictures. Um, I don't know who's watching this right now. All I know is that I was told that you can trust us and you can share these photos and the people that are watching are gonna be able, you know, they're not gonna do anything and abuse what you're showing them and telling them about. So there is definitely a part of it. I, I would say, get to know who, what natives come from what area you're working in and try to develop a relationship with them 
and they can tell you so much more than any research paper that you'll ever try to find or develop on your own. And if you could develop that relationship uh, in anywhere in the United States or wherever you're working, uh, it's so beneficial. And uh, yeah, that would be my advice. Well, Martin, thank you very much for, for giving us your trust. I, I, we, we greatly appreciate it. And um, we feel honored to, to have this little glimpse in, in the subsistence way of life that you and your family members and friends have been, been able to sustain for so many years. So thank you for that, for sure. Um, uh, there's a question from Ebet and the Integrated Ecosystems class um, asking directly to you, Martin, can, can you think of an example of something you harvest, whether it's berries, fish, mammals, et cetera, that has changed since you were a kid on the island? Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, there is definitely changes. Uh, one thing that's kind of hard to find nowadays is salmon berries on St. Paul. For whatever reason, I don't know what that change is. Maybe Lauren can speak more to that, the temperature or something, but salmon berries used to be plentiful and you could harvest a lot for everybody, but those are kind of hard to come by now. And, and uh, for whatever reason, it's actually easier to get them in St. George. And, uh, but um, you watch, we could see with our eyes that there's a lot less seals. And you can see from how hard it is to fish and how, how less uh, halibut there is in, in the water. We, we harvest halibut, we have harvested halibut for thousands of years, for seals for thousands of years. And we could tell you it's, it's a lot more difficult to get those things now than it used to be. And, uh, and uh, the quality of what you're going after too, the size you could, you could easily get a, a very large halibut uh, not too long ago. Whereas nowadays you, you have to get a few halibut to, to fill your freezer up for the winter or, or you have to go out and, and uh, in the winter time when you're trying to go after sea lion uh, with your rifle, uh, then it's, the seals are just not there like they used to be. So we notice these changes and uh, the sentinels, the men out there, they can tell you all about that. Well, thank you. Thank you for that, Martin. Thanks for that perspective. Um, we, we are at that, we're a little bit past actually the 8.30 hour. Um, so I think I will end this evening's rock talk. I, I really want to extend a, a gracious thank you to both you, Lauren, and you, Martin, for giving us an hour of, of your time. Uh, we really greatly appreciate your perspective and your storytelling and your data sharing. It's, it's really been very informative to all of us. Um, you know, Martin, we have on Appledore Island our own little fleet of four-wheel drive vehicles, so maybe we can get you and, and some of your family members out there for a visit to buzz around the island. Um, <laughs> uh, I love <yeah>. that. <laughs> <laughs> there's there's I'm folks easy. chiming in here that are just echoing my sentiments of thanking you both very much in the chat, so we really appreciate you giving us your time, and uh, we look forward to interacting with you again in the future whenever that time may come. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thanks everybody that attended. Thank you. Thank you, Rock Talk, for inviting us. We really appreciate this. All right. Well, everyone take care. And um, for our folks on the island, I hope you have a pleasant evening and enjoy the sunset back on the mainland. And uh, for those of you from afar, thanks for joining us. <laughs>